so that was a little bit of a piece of something that I wrote. That's just a little part of it. Uh, it's kind of got this Arabic taste to it. All right, so uh, let's see. We're going to go over the practice problems for exam three, and uh, these should be the main ideas for non-calculator part of exam. All right, so to begin with, let's take a look at just basically plotting complex numbers. Okay, very simple thing that we want to learn how to do. And uh, so if you got part A, you got two plus four I. So the real part is two. And the imaginary part is four I. So again, if you're doing real, you're going left or right on the real axis, imaginary is up or down. So this is going to be to the right and then up. So to the right and then up four. So that would locate that point right there for point A. Okay, the next one is negative three minus four I, and that's gonna be left on the real axis and down on the imaginary axis. So we do that, left three, down four, put dot, and then we are done. And then the last one is negative three I, and that of course really means zero minus three I. So this is your real part, that's your imaginary part. So you're not gonna go left or right on the real, you're just gonna go down three on the imaginary, and then that's where point C is located. So a very basic thing that I want you to know how to do. Uh, the remaining part of the semester, for the most part, is going to depend on that when we're doing the complex numbers and the trig form. Okay, next thing I would like you to know how to do is to convert um, polar, uh, polar coordinates to rectangular. So that's what the problem says. You're going to take this to, to rectangular. So remember, you're going to create a system of coordinates with x and y. So what you're doing is you're translating r theta, the polar coordinates, to x, y. So what you have to remember is two very fundamental things is that x is equal to r cosine theta and then y is equal to r sine theta. That's very, very important you remember that. And remember, those are just the definitions of the cosine and sine solved for x and y. That's all that is. That's where it comes from. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do x equals the radius 3 times the cosine of 3 pi over 4. Okay, so that is going to give 3. And if you look at your unit circle, 3 pi over 4, the cosine is going to be this value. So you're just going to multiply that by uh, negative square root of 2 over 2. And if you multiply that out, that's going to give negative 3 root 2 over 2. Okay, and the next thing you're going to do is uh, R3, and then you're going to do sine of 3 pi over 4 that you're given. Okay, so that just means look up on the unit circle at the Y value at 3 pi over 4. All right, so what that's going to give you is 3 times positive square root of 3 over 2. No, that's not right. Square root of 2 over 2, sorry erase. All right, let me reload this stupid thing. <clears throat> okay, so um, so that would be times uh, square root of 2 over 2. All right, so the final answer is going to be this. Okay, negative 3 radical 2 over 2 comma 3 radical 2 over 2. All right, all right, next problem we do exactly the same way. So what we're gonna do is, again, x equals our cosine theta. I'm giving you on this the radius is negative three, the cosine of negative 180. All right, so again, that just means go to negative 180, which would be clockwise halfway around the circle, and you would look at the cosine being the x value. Okay, so simply all you gotta do on this is go negative three times negative one, which is equal to three. So that gives the X value of the rectangular coordinate is three. Then what you do is the sine, which is Y equals R sine theta. Okay, the radius is negative three. You're doing the sine of uh, negative 180 degrees. Okay, so find the Y value. Okay, like that. So it's just gonna be zero. And that's gonna be negative three times zero. So that's equal to zero. So your polar coordinate has been transformed to that rectangular coordinate like that. 
Okay, this is a real, real easy problem to interpret too, and I can demonstrate that on the unit circle, so you know, it's good to always make sense of what you're doing. Uh, if you were on not a unit circle, but a, you know, a circle with uh, this radius, what you would end up having on this, and rectangular, you would be on the x-axis, and really in polar, if you were plotting this, uh, this coordinate that I gave you, you would go to negative 180, which is here, but then since the radius is negative 3, you would go away from it, so it would be in the same location. So that's a good thing to think about. Okay, now the next thing I want to do is I'm giving you rectangular coordinates, and then what we want to do on this is we want to convert these uh, to, to polar. All right, so the way to do this to begin with is uh, go ahead, you'd want to find basically R and theta, so I've given you X and Y. Your job is to figure out what R and theta is in that order. you got to put your polar coordinates in the right order. Okay, so basically we know that the relationship between X, Y, and R is the Pythagorean theorem. So we say R squared equals X squared plus Y squared, uh, which is going to mean just plug this in. So we're going to get R squared equals negative square root of 3 squared plus negative 1 squared. Okay, the radical comes off there giving 3, and that's 1. So that gives r squared equals 4. Taking the square to both sides, you're going to get r is equal to 2. Now technically it's plus or minus 2, but if you look at my directions, it says use a positive radius. So I've got to put a 2 like that. And then I'm ready to find angle theta. Now what I want to do on that just a minute is slide down my unit circle for a second here. Or just post, kind of paste a new one on here. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so, uh, you know, you've constructed your unit circle so you can refer to this. So basically, what's going on in this problem is... In rectangular, you're to the left and you're down, so you're in quadrant three. So you're over here somewhere in rectangular. And so you know that it's going to have to deal with, you know, either this or this, since those have got the square root of three in it. So one approach to doing this is actually to do reference triangles. That's the way I'm going to look at it. There's more than one way to look at this, though. So I'm going to bring down a uh, just a coordinate system here. I'll just kind of write this over at the right here, right? Or the left, <laughs> my other right. Okay, so uh, we're going to go like this. We're going to go to the left and down, okay, like this. And uh, if you look at this, if you made a triangle out of this, okay, that's your, that's your radius. You can make a reference triangle. So you can think of going to the left, square root of three, and going down one, and then you can end up finding that angle like that. So really, that's got to be a, a 1, 3, square root of 3, 2 triangle. So that means that that angle right there has to be a 30 degree reference angle. Okay. So actually, what you're doing in this problem is you're looking at that angle right there. Okay. So if you went to that point, uh, then you would have that ratio like that then. So that would end up giving us our angle of 210 degrees. Right. And then that would change that to us for our, our polar coordinates, okay? All right, so that's one way to look at that is figure out the angle. There's more than one way you can look at this, by the way, and the other process you can go through on this is you can do the tangent. So we know the tangent of theta equals y over x. y is negative one. x in our uh, problem is root three. So you're really just looking at the tangent of theta is equal to 1 over root 3, and that does happen at this point right here. So notice if you're at 210 degrees, y over x is negative 1 half, all over negative root 3 over 2, 2's cross out, negatives cross out, and so you end up having that. So you can look at the problem that way too if you want to. It doesn't matter as long as you get the angle correct. Okay, the next one we'll do um, uh, another coordinate system on. I always encourage you always on these problems to draw a picture. It'll help you to understand what's going on in the problem. So what this one, I'm giving you the x and y coordinates. 
your job is to find r and theta. Okay, so I'm just going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 down. And that's where the point 0, negative 8 is located in uh, rectangular. And in polar, you know, realize that what you, what you have going on is you have all these circles and you don't have to consider this circle when you're drawing your diagram. It doesn't matter. But I want to just sort of remind you of that, that we're really looking at a circle and that circle is going to have a radius of 8. And then all we got to do really is just kind of figure out what that angle is. So you can easily tell you've got these two things. You've got a radius of 8. Okay, then you've got an angle that you could write as 270 degrees. And again, that matches my directions, which we're saying give an angle between 0 and 360. Okay, so the answer we're going to have is 8 for the radius, 270 degrees uh, for theta. Okay, so that's the other thing that you want to be able to do is converting coordinates is something uh, that, that you also want to be able to do. All right, moving on. Now what we're going to do is transform, uh, review how to transform a rectangular equations into polar equations. Okay, so again, the key things on these problems there's two key things you always want to remember. Uh, X is equal to R cosine theta, and Y is equal to R sine theta. You have to know that. I won't give that to you on an exam, so it's very fundamental to doing a lot of this stuff with, with polar coordinates. So really all you do on this one is you just replace the Y with what Y is equal to. Okay, and Y is equal to R sine theta, and then that's equal to 5. You don't have to do anything else with that. Your answer is R, R sine theta is equal to 5. Okay, no, no simplification that you do on that one much. Okay, next one will have a little bit more substitution and, and um, simplification on. So with this one, we have X, and X is going to get replaced with R sine, I, I'm sorry, R cosine theta. What am I doing? Okay, there's our cosine theta. So x is our cosine theta. So I'm going to put in our cosine theta for x. Okay, y is our sine theta. And then we have x. So x is going to get replaced with our cosine theta. All right? So that is the substitution. Now that is not simplified, but it's, it's done as far as the substitution process goes. So what we need to do is just multiply it out. X is our cosine theta, Y is our, our sine theta. I just caught my little mistake on that. I would have caught it in a minute anyway because I kind of know what's going to happen. So that's going to be R sine theta like that. All right, we're going to square this. So that's going to be R squared cosine squared theta there. Square this. This is going to be R squared sine squared theta. And then this side, leave that alone as for cosine theta. Okay. Now, one thing we can do on this is notice uh, algebraically we have a common factor of R squared. So let's go ahead and let's take that out and see what we get. So when we do that, we're going to have R squared cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 4R cos four cosine theta. And then notice on this, this is the fundamental Pythagorean identity, so that's equal to 1. So now we've got r squared times 1 is equal to 4r times cosine theta. So if I move this over here, I've got r squared equals 4r cosine theta. And you can go through and divide by r on this to simplify it further. Okay, So when you do that, you would end up with r on that side. r's cross out, leaving you 4 cosine theta like that. All right, so the final answer is r is equal to for cosine theta. All right, the next thing I would like to look at is uh, just a review of how you plot polar coordinates. And uh, let's do several, several examples on that. All right, so let's go ahead and do, and do these problems. See if we got, remember how to do these, okay. All right, so on, uh, a, first thing you want to do is you want to locate negative pi over 4. Okay, so that's negative 45 degrees. We know that's negative 45. 
So we're going to go like this, locate the pole. That pole is really the same thing as this pole. And then since that's a negative uh, radius of three, you're not going to go towards it. You're going to go away from it. So if you start here, you go one, two, three, then that's where that's located. So that is the location of point A. Okay, point B, you're going to find 3 pi over 2, which of course is here on this pole. It's got a positive radius, so you're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 out towards it. So that would give you the location of point B. All right, next one is 30 degrees, and remember pi over 6 is 30 degrees. Okay, so we're going to go to 30 degrees, which is here. This time you have a negative radius. So start from the center and go away from the pole this way. All right, so that would be the location of point C. And then the last one's 135, which is the same as 90 degrees plus 45 more. So you're at this pole. And then since that's a positive radius, you would go out one unit like that. So that would be the location of point B. Okay, so you want to be sure that you know how to plot basic polar coordinates. Those are all the different possibilities that essentially exist on that. All right, now let's see, just a few things as far as some true and false questions on here. Okay, so um, different things. Huron's formula. So you want to think about when can you use Huron's formula. Huron's formula is used to find an area of a triangle but it's the side, side, side case. So that's a false statement. So be sure you know some fundamental facts about triangles. Huron's formula goes with the side, side, side triangle. Okay, the ambiguous case. All right, the ambiguous case, remember, if you have that, the triangle can have zero, one, or two solutions. This problem says you can have zero or one, but you can't have two. Yes, you can. So that's also a false statement. Right. This one says the ambiguous case is SSA. ASS, if you prefer, okay, is the ambiguous case. Always sticks in students' heads if you look at it that way. All right, And that's the ambiguous case. Remember, a ASS case is the one where you're given an angle, then a side, then a side, and you're going clockwise or counterclockwise around the circle. Okay. All right, let's see. Other things that I want you all to know, and this is pretty important as far as is, um, structure and the equations of polar equations. The cardioid, I'll give you an example of a cardioid. You have the structure R equals A plus or minus A cosine theta, or you could have A plus or minus A sine theta. That's what cardioids look like. And the key thing is these two numbers are the same, okay? So if you look at this particular problem, that's got the structure of a cardioid, so that's what cardioids look like, okay? The numbers are the same. The other one I'd like you to know is the limacon, and the limacon has this structure, R equals A plus or minus B cosine theta, or R equals A plus or minus B sine theta, okay? So what you end up having on this is the numbers are different, see? So an example of a limacon would be something like this. You could have r equals 3 plus or minus 5 cosine theta. The key thing is it has the same structure as a cardioid, but it ends up having uh, that. Don't worry about the inner loop, outer loop, or, or not outer loop, inner loop dimpled and some of the things we look at. I'm just interested in the basic structure. Okay, and let's see, this last one right here is talking about law of cosines. The two times you can use the law of cosines are side, 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 and side, angle, side. And remember, let me give you an example of one of the law of cosines. Law of cosines, you have, pick a side, a squared, and remember, it's the sum of the squares of the other two sides minus twice the product of those two sides, then the cosine of the angle that's opposite this side, a, would be capital A like that. So the way I remember this is, well, the, the law of cosines formula has all three sides in it, okay? So that means you could find a leftover angle by using the law of cosines. The other way to look at this is you could end up having this kind of situation on a triangle. If you had A 
B and C like this, if you have uh, the sides going like we know, if you were given B, C, and A, you have the side angle side case, which allows you to find what that side A is. So if you happen to have forgot that, write down the formula, the law of cosines formula, and reason it out, see. Okay. Okay, now we're going to look a little bit at graphing um, and continue to do some, convert some polar equations to rectangular. So anytime that you have something like theta equals just some value a. Okay, you got an angle. This is going to be a line that's going to have the point zero, zero on it. Okay, so really all we need to do on this one is locate that. That is a negative 60 degree angle. So you would locate this as this pole right here. And then all you really need to do on that is just shade in that pole. So all I'm going to do is find that pole, shade it in, and then that would be what the graph of that polar equation is. So it's got a very sim simple structure to it. Now if you're going to change this to a rectangular coordinate system, uh, probably one of the best ways to look at this is just to look at a coordinate system and reason out the line. So that's what I'm going to do on this is we know that y is equal to mx plus b. So one simple thing we knew on this problem, of course, is we know the y-intercept is 0. So that's a given. The line is always going to go through 0, 0. And now we just need to figure out the slope. So what I'm going to do on this uh, primarily is um, I'm going to go through and just draw a line, and then we're going to look at a reference triangle on this for a minute. And we can use our knowledge of triangles to figure out what this slope is going to be. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I draw a line, and I'm going to make a reference triangle out of that. Okay, we also know this is a this is a negative 60 degree angle, but we can think of that as a 60 degree reference angle. So then I can draw my triangle like this, and the sides. This gives you a 30-60 triangle where the sides are. Opposite that is going to be 1. Opposite that's going to be square root of 3, and that's going to be 2. All right Now, you would have a negative y value and a positive x value. So we know the slope is equal to the rise over the run. So if you were just going like from, say, this point to this point on the line, you would be going down, negative root 3, and you would be going to the right, 1. So the rise is going to be down negative root 3, the run's going to be 1. So that means the final answer to this problem is going to be y equals negative root 3 over 1x plus 0, or just y equals negative square root of 3x. Okay, so if you've got any, um, any of these, t these angles on a unit circle, which is what you're wanting to know how to do, then you don't have to use a calculator to figure that slope out. It's just basically knowledge of your of your right triangles and unit circle. Okay, all right. So that's a real easy line uh, type of equation to learn how to how to graph them. Okay, so moving down to this next one, uh, this says this is a polar equation. So I'm giving you a polar equation. We're going to come up with an equation that's rectangular. So the idea is we're going from r theta we're translating that to the variables x and y. So again, it's all about the basic substitutions. One of the things that's real important when you do this is if you've got a polar equation and you want to convert it, is you want to introduce, it may already be there, but if not, you want to introduce r cosine theta or r sine theta in the problem. So you want to introduce those, and the reason is is because that's what x is, and that's what y is. So notice you just have a 10 sine theta there. So there's a couple of ways that you could do this. Probably the best way to do this is if you want an r in front of that sine theta, is it's an equation, so you can multiply both sides of this equation by r, right? So this is going to give r squared, and I'm going to write that as 10r sine theta, then I'm allowed to do my substitution. So what I've got 
basically is this, and we know that y is equal to r sine theta. So this whole thing right here is going to get replaced with y. We also know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So that means this variable is going to get replaced with that. So all you would really have to do on this is the answer is going to be replace that with um, x squared plus y squared equals, then you have 10, and then replace r sine theta with y, and that's, that's far enough. You don't have to simplify that any further. Once you get everything plugged in, then you're fine. All right, moving on, here's uh, some more graphs that you want to know how to do. These graphs are very simple just kind of knowledge of the polar coordinate system and the substitutions. So first of all, on, um, on this first problem, if you're graphing r equals 2, just remember that's a circle with center 0, 0. So all you would have to do on this problem is you would just draw a circle with a radius of 2. You just need to fill in um, that second circle. I'm trying to be fancy here and everything, but you get the point. Okay, you just uh, shade in that particular circle like that, okay? Doesn't have to be a perfect circle, then you've got your answer. Now, the other thing that we're going to do with this is convert this to, uh, to polar, or I'm sorry, to rectangular, so I'm not going to be fancy. I just we're going to do it like that, okay? All right, so we got that. Now, uh, what we want to do is we have r equals 2, and remember we've got this substitution. We know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Okay, so that would tell us that if we did the square root of both sides, we would have r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. So that means that we're going to replace this r with this, and then we'll be converted uh, to the rectangular system. So replace that with x squared plus y squared, leave the two. Right. Now what you do is get rid of the radical. So how do you get rid of radicals? Well, you square both sides. So you would end up having, as a result, x squared plus y squared is equal to 4 as your equation. And it's really helpful on this problem if you understand from like college algebra or pre-calculus that that is the general form of a circle with radius 2 at center 0, 0. All right. So that's how you do it. Very simple to do. Okay, next one. Now this one you want to start by converting the equation to rectangular because it's a lot easier to do. So we got a real simple substitution in here. What we know is we know that y is equal to r sine theta. So that means what I'm going to do is replace this thing with y and that'll give y equals 3. So that is the equation in terms of rectangular. Then it's just a matter of going through and plotting that point. In rectangular, you know that's a horizontal line that goes through y equals 3. So that's all you do. Okay. Once you convert that to rectangular, then, then you graph it thinking of rectangular superimposed over the polar coordinate system. That's it. Next one you do pretty much the same way. So you have 5 is equal to r cosine theta. We know that x is equal to r cosine theta, so that means this whole thing gets replaced with x. So we got 5 is equal to x, or just write that as x equals 5. So we know in rectangular that if we have x equals a number, that is a vertical line that goes through x equals 5. So what you do is just take your vertical line right through like that. And you got your answer. Okay, man, this technology is so neat. I can make beautiful, perfect graphs. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Okay, so I'm going to look through a couple other things. And on this, uh, on this next thing here, uh, we're going to do a couple of things. We're going to graph this equation that I've given you here. But we're going to start by graphing this equation in rectangular. So we're just we're not really converting it. We're just considering theta as x, and we're considering r as y. Then we're going to go through and do a graph. Now, one thing I am going to do on this is I'm going to pull up a unit circle. So I want to paste a, a unit circle 
on here because that will help you maybe interpret this a little better if I do, the, do it this way. So we're going to start by just drawing out a, a coordinate system, a rectangular coordinate system like this now. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's do that. Let's go ahead and just get a, a rectangular system. And since we're only going from uh, 0 to 2 pi, let's just consider, hold on, not that way. Let's just consider, move over. There we go. Okay, so we're just going to do like this. So go ahead and draw yourself out a rectangular system. And then we'll go ahead and just get this plotted. Again, we're just going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, this is going back to basically how we learned how to graph in this system. So let's go ahead and just use pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and then 2 pi like that. And you can subdivide that if you wanted to, like in pi over 4, for greater accuracy, you got pi over 4, then you could go uh, to 3 pi over 4, and then to 5 pi over 4, and then to 7 pi over 4. You don't have to do that, but I'm actually going to do this on this problem because it gives a little bit of greater accuracy. Now again, on an exam, we don't give you a unit circle like we've done all semester, so you want to create that if you want to, and then you can utilize this. Now, a couple of things we've got on this is um, we have this part of the problem, which has an amplitude of 6 that we learned about. So I'm going to graph y equals 6 sine x, and then this number is going to take all those points up 3. That's what we learned about translations. So if you think about this, the, the maximum on this wave is going to be up 6. If we take 6 and move it up 3, we're going to need to go up to 9. So what I would like you to do then is just go up to 9. So there's 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Like that, and then we can do the same thing going down, although you're not going to have to go all the way down. Probably negative 5 is sufficient on that. So I've got to actually do this in two stages. The first thing I want to do is just graph this, and I'll graph that in a dashed line. And you don't have to do this. You can graph the whole thing in one stage if you want to. I don't care. So uh, we want to go ahead and just start getting our, our points on here then. So when we do our points, remember a sign starts here. So you're going to have a point there. Then it hits its max. However, since we have an amplitude change, the next point goes there. Then it's going to go down to that point. Now it's ready to go to its min, but that's going to go down to negative 6. Then back there, like that. And then um, when you get to 3 pi over 2, it's going to be back here. And then you're going to be back to 2 pi like that. So you're cycling through all those points. And boy, did I mess up. I just realized that as, as I was doing that. So I need to definitely correct myself on that. Uh, pay attention to the key points, not the subintervals like that. So I need to do this one more time. My apologies. Okay, so let's do that again. Uh, so, uh, when we do this, uh, sine starts there. Okay, now we go to pi over 2, which is where the max is. So, that's going to go up to 6. Then we go to pi. Then we go to 3 pi over 2, which is down negative 6. And then back like that. Okay, these are the little sub-intervals. So, there's no period change on that then. So, then I'm just going to kind of, in my mind, just lightly dash that in. Uh, like that, and then I've got one period of that graph. So now what I'm going to do is just move everything up three. All right, so I'll go ahead and, and do that, and then we'll get the, the final graph on here then, okay? All right, so let's do that. This point is going to go up three, so one, two, three. It's going to go up there, and I'm going to write that point down in just a minute. This point right here is up six, so that's going to go up to nine, this point needs to go up 3, so it goes to a y value of 3. This point's at negative 6. Negative 6 up 3 goes to negative 3. So that point's going to go there. Then that point's going to go up 3 like that. So what you have 
essentially is you have, this would be the graph of the sine wave going through those points like that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and write these points down. So like this point here is 0, 3. And as I'm doing these, I'll we'll highlight this. This is a point pi over 2, 9 now. This is a point pi, um, 3. This is a point 3 pi over 2 and negative 3. And then finally this point is 2 pi 3 like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these points and we're going to plot those in rectangular or in polar. Okay, so what we can do, we can also do this if you want to. We could get further points on the unit circle. So as I'm graphing this out, I'm going to show you that. Uh, on my unit circle. So I'm going to move this, these points down. What I'm going to do is just go ahead and rewrite these points and then I'll move this down so you can see what I'm doing on polar and I want to zoom in on that. So we start with 0, 3. We're going to do these in order. Pi over 2, 9. Then we're going to go to these two. We're going to go pi over 3, or sorry, pi 3. 3 pi over 2, negative 3 and then 2 pi 3. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to plot these points then. Now you can use this, you can use estimations on this, but these are kind of the key points that you have. So I want to kind of zoom on this so you can see both of these graphs simultaneously then. Okay, so let's start by uh, plotting our points then. Um, so to begin with, we're going to do 0, 3. So that means you're at 0, and you go out to the third circle. So you have a radius of 3, so that takes care of that. Then you've got pi over 2, 9. Here's pi over 2, this pole. So you're going to go out 9 like that, put a dot there. Okay, and then you kind of connect those as we go. And what's happening on this is these y values are getting bigger. So notice you have a y value of 3. Well, it's getting bigger, and it's eventually going to get to 9. Okay, so, and these angles are also getting bigger, so this thing is going to do something kind of like this, okay, to start with. All right, now we move on to the point pi 3. So here's pi. This pole is pi. Then you're going to move out 3. And remember, you're moving towards the pole because that's a positive radius. Be careful about that. So you're going to be to that point, okay? Now, if you look at between these two points, what's happening is the y values are getting smaller as you go to this next set of points. So that's exactly what's going to happen is those points are going to get smaller like that. Okay. Now we move on to the next one, which is 3 pi over 2, negative 3. Now here's 3 pi over 2, but since the radius is negative, you're not going to go towards the pole. You're going to go away from it. So now you have a point here. So if you actually looked at uh, this piece of the graph up here, what's happening is the y values are getting smaller. So um, as, as you go through this, you're just taking these y values, and the, what's going to happen on those things is they're going to loop around. <clears throat> okay, so what you want to do with this then is, is you can go ahead and just realize how this goes. And I'm going to erase one little thing on here because, you know, and this doesn't matter that much to me, but I want to show you something on this. I'm going to show you something on the calculator here in just a minute, too. So, again, if we had those points um, 0, 3, we had this point right here. We had pi over 2, 9. Then we had pi 3. And then we had uh, 3 pi over 2, negative 3. And then you go back to the... 2 pi, which is here, back to 3 like this. So what happens is you're going through these points. Now it does kind of go out to more of a circle like that. I wasn't paying attention to that, although that does not matter that much to me at this stage. So what's happening on this is the, the points go more like this. And this is just knowledge. You'd get this a little bit more with, with uh, plotting more points. And it goes through like that, like that, and then kind of like that. Okay, so that's a limacon. This is a structure of a limacon like that. Now I was going to show you on my graphing calculator. Let me pull this up. So let me pause just a minute. 
Okay, so on your graphing calculator, uh, I'm going to put this problem in. So uh, 3 plus 6 sine theta is what we we're doing. And then I'll show you on this. You're not allowed to use your calculator on this because I'm looking at a sketch. I would just be looking that you understand that that limicon with the inner loop goes like that. Now watch how this goes as I graph this. So you're going to see it go through these points. Then it's going to go through and then do that inner loop like that. Okay, so that's kind of how that goes. So as long as you've got a, a basic shape and you know about the inner loop, you don't have to have accuracy of every little point for this purpose, uh, that have the idea that you'd be fine on that then. Okay? All right, so that's uh, basically the idea of taking this uh, function and graphing it in a rectangular plane and then superimposing those points in polar like that. Okay, now we're going to do a couple of things with identities. Uh, to finish this up then, on this part of the review. So we want to be sure that you study how to do the, the different half-angle identities. And uh, the half-angle identities, remember, go like these. These are things that I do give you. So uh, if, if you're looking at the sine of alpha over 2, or the cosine of alpha 2, or the tangent of alpha 2 over there, mainly what I'm looking at is these two right here. So uh, the definite, the way this goes, and let me pause just for a second. I need to do something with this calculator for a second. Okay, let me get my calculator closed off here. Okay, so the identities basically go like this, remember. And again, I'll give these things to you. The uh, half angle identity for sine is plus or minus square root of one minus cosine x over two. The cosine's pretty similar. That one is plus or minus the square root of 1 plus cosine x over 2. Then the tangent half angle identity, there's actually three forms of it. There's uh, 1 minus cosine x, 1 plus cosine x. That's not really that good of a version to use. You also have 1 minus cosine x over sine x. And then you have, uh, I think the other version is 1, no, it's... Um, Let's, yeah, this, 1 minus cosine x. No, this, I'm thinking backwards. Sine x over 1 plus cosine x. So those are the three forms you have. If you're dealing with a tangent, this is the best one to use. I wouldn't even bother using those two because this is easier. You have no radical and you have a monomial, just one term in the denominator. All right, so the first thing we want to probably do with this one is I would recommend that you just see what this angle is. So we, we're going to replace pi with 180. Well, let's crunch that out. So let's go ahead and just divide 180 divided by 12. This is probably 75 or something. So 12 goes into 18 once. 6 left over. Bring down the 0. 12 into 65 times. So yeah, you get uh, a 15. So you've got 5 times 15 which is equal to 75 degrees. Okay, so if you're doing the half angle identity, you want to write this like this. this. You want to write this as the sine of, and you want to double that angle, see? So if you double that, you're going to have 150, so you're going to work with the sine of 150 degrees um, over 2. Okay, uh, so you have to double that angle in order to use the half angle identity because half of 150 is 75. Okay, then we're going to apply this identity. So this is going to go like this. First of all, uh, you're looking at 75 degrees. That angle is 75 degrees. That's quadrant one, which is going to tell you that you're going to use the positive square root. Okay, so that symbol's got to be positive for that reason. Then we just plug into our identity. So we're going to say one, just like the identity says, one minus cosine of 150 and then all over 2. So now it just sort of boils down to a, uh, a unit circle. So uh, in a unit circle, I'll just put a little, little diagram on this. If you're at 150, you're actually at this point on the unit circle right here, and that point is the point negative square root of 3 over 2, 1 half. Okay, so the cosine is going to be equal to the x value at that point. So you're going to replace that, then simplify this. So you're going to have 
uh, the square root of 1 minus negative square root of 3 over 2 all over 2. All right, so that will give the square root of 1 plus the square root of 3 over 2 all over 2. And then you want to get rid of that complex fraction. So what you're going to do is go under the radical, multiply the numerator by 2, and then multiply the denominator by 2. And when you do that, you'll end up with this as your final answer. So we've got 2 times 1 is 2. When you multiply these two things, the 2's cross out. So you get square root of 3 all over 4. And then you can go through and take that square root and the denominator. So the final answer you would get on this, the conclusion would be sine of 5 pi over 12 is going to be equal to the square root of 2 plus the square root of 3 all over 2, because you've got the square root of 4 is 2. So that would be your solution to your problem. Okay. All right, so you want to be able to handle the identities. Again, these identities are, are given. You just need to know how to use that identity and prove you know how to do that. Okay, now we want to look maybe at double angle identities. Generally, what I'm looking for on double angle identities is um, your knowledge of how to use these in this type of a problem, not to find exact values of angles, but just to interpret triangles and have a given trig function and find a, uh, find a trig function of double that angle and so forth. So to begin with, with these problems, we need to just, I'm going to write down what these are, and then these things are things that I do give you. So the sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta cosine theta. And by the way, it's good to get these things memorized because then it's a little faster for you. So we have that as the cosine double angle identity. The cosine double angle identity goes like this. This is the one that's got three forms. So it's cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Uh, that can be then written as it, 2 cosine squared theta minus 1, and then that can also be written as 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. So those are the three forms of that particular identity then. All right, so the other thing is the tangent double angle identity, and that's the one that, uh, that goes like this. This, will, this one goes 2 tangent theta, Uh, like that. Hang on just a second. Okay, and that's 1 minus uh, tangent squared theta. Okay, now again, these things are all going to be given to you, but you've got to know how to use these. So on this last, this problem number 21, what you're doing is you're wanting to find the cosine of 2 theta. So you want to start just by picking whatever identity you want to use. It doesn't make any difference which one you want to use. You're going to get the same answer. I'm going to pick this one. I like to use the ones that have got one trig function in it. That's my philosophy behind that. So let's write down 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. So really all we got to do is figure out the cosine theta from this diagram. And the cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's going to be 3 fifths. So I can write this as 2. Cosine of theta is 3 fifths minus 1. So that will be, put that 2 over 1, you get 6 fifths. And I forgot to uh, square that. I need to square that. So be careful about that. Pay attention. Unlike your teacher. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So what we got is 2 over 1, and then we've got uh, 9 over 25 minus 1 like that. All right. So then when we do that, multiply that out, you're going to have 18 over 25 minus 1. I'll go ahead and just get a common denominator on that. So you would get the final answer of negative 7 over 25. So we would conclude that the cosine of 2 theta, based on this diagram, is the value negative 7 over 25. Okay, so if I'm asking you for to do a trig function of a double angle, write down the identity, and that will pretty well lead you through how to solve the problem. Okay, so I'm going to do one with a tangent and a sine also. So let's do the next one. So start by writing down the sine of 2 theta is equal to 2 sine theta, cosine theta. And then I'm going to do a diagram on this one, I guess. So that'll kind of help reason this out. You don't have to do this, but I recommend it. Helps me. 
All right, so let's see, what are we given? We're given that we're in quadrant three, and we're given that the tangent of theta is equal to seven over 24. So you're over in this quadrant somewhere. The key thing that you need to know is if you're in quadrant three, x is negative, y is negative, and of course r is always positive. And if you've been given the fact that the tangent of theta is equal to seven over 24, the definition of the tangent is y over x. So that's going to mean that y has to be negative seven, it has to be, x has to be negative 24. Okay, so what we got is we've got this piece of information and then we got that piece of information like that. All right, now if we're gonna find the sine and cosine, which we have to do from here, then we gotta use the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so, and I think r is 25. Let me just verify that real quick. So let's do r squared equals x squared, negative 24 squared plus y squared, negative seven squared like that. Okay, so let's see, 24, let's just multiply 24 times 24. So four times four is 16. That's nine, two times four is eight, two times two is four. Okay, so we've got to carry, that'd be 576, plus seven squared is 49. Okay, then if you add those two things, if we take 576 and add 49, they're gonna get five, 12, 625, that's what I thought. Okay, so the square root of 625 is gonna be 25. Okay, so here's what we do then. We go back to our problem. To finish this up, we're gonna have two times the sine times the cosine. Uh, the cosine is going to be x over r, so that's going to be negative 24 over 25. The cosine is, whoops, I'm doing that totally wrong. Pay attention. I'm getting in a hurry here, sorry. Okay, so we got two times the sine. The sine is y over r, so that's negative 7 over 25. Cosine is negative 24 over 25. And then we're ready to, to put this all together and multiply this out. Okay, so multiply out the denominator. That's going to be 625. Uh, let's see, 24 times 2 is 48. And I can do 48 times 7. So 8 times 7 is 56. 4 times 7 is 28. 28 plus uh, 5, we want to do, do that. <coughs> So that's going to be 33. So we should get an answer of 336 over 625. All right. That's, so those kind of big numbers. I usually try on non-calculator part of the exam to give fairly small numbers, but that's doable. All right. And let's see. The last one we're going to do the tangent on. So uh, let's start by writing down the identity for, the two, for tangent 2 theta. That's 2 tangent theta over one minus tangent squared theta, okay, like that. And uh, again, I'll draw a diagram and just kind of chart out the information we're given. So this time it looks like you're given that we're in quadrant two, which tells me X is negative, Y is positive, and we know that R is always positive. So I think it's kind of good to start off the problem that way. And what you're given is you're given that the sine of theta is 20 over 29, and since the definition of the sine is y over r, that's going to tell you that y is, is 20, and then r is 29, so that leaves us to find the value of x, because we do have to find the tangent. So we're going to have to use Pythagorean theorem on this and try to do this without a calculator. Okay, Pretty big numbers, but it's doable. So we have r squared equals x squared plus y squared. Uh, so I'm going to replace r with 29. We're going to do 29 squared, x squared, and then y is uh, 20. Okay. So let's see, 29 squared. Let's multiply it out the old-fashioned way. 9 times 9 is 81. 2 times 9 is 18. 18 plus 8 is 26. Then 2 times 9 is 18. Carry the 1. 2 times 2 is 4. Okay, like that. Uh, plus the 1 would be 58, so that's 1, 14, 
And then two and five, you got to carry. That's going to be seven. Whoa, 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 whoa. Right neat here. I'm not writing very neat, so let's do a better job of this good stuff. Okay, so we've got that. Two times nine is 18. And uh, two times two is going to be four, like that. So if we do two times nine, we got 18. Carry the one. Two times two is four, plus one is five, like that. So you have one, 14. Carry the one, five, six, seven, eight, 41, like that. All right, so that's 841 equals x squared, and then 20 squared is 400. So we can subtract 400 from both sides. This is probably not a real good non-calculator problem. I'll be a little bit more careful on that. So this is 441 uh, equals x squared. I think that's 21. Let's see, I'm pretty sure is what that is. So x is going to be equal to uh, 21 when you do that square root like that. Okay, so now what we're ready to do then is, um, is go through and plug these values in, into the identity up here. So we just figured out that x is negative 21, y is 20, and then r is 29. Okay, so uh, when we do this, um, just get everything plugged in, and we'll have this. Okay, the tangent is y over x, so that's going to be 20 over negative 21. Okay, the denominator is going to be 1 minus 20 over negative 21 squared, so now it's just a matter of working out all the arithmetic. So in the numerator, you're going to have, if you multiply that straight across, you're going to have 40 over negative 21, denominator you're going to have 1 minus and if you square 20 you get 400 if you square 21 you get 441 like that and then what you got to do is just uh, work out that complex fraction on that so one thing you'll notice on this is if you multiply the top and bottom by 441 then it'll work like this. This would be a bad problem to give for a non-calculator thing. It really would. So let's see. If you do this, 441 divided by 21 is 21. So that means the numerator is going to end up having 40 times 21 like that. Then the denominator, 441 times 441, gives this. Then when you multiply these two things, that'll cross that out and give 400. Okay. And then what we want to do is go ahead and just do 40 times 21. And there's different ways to do that. Let's just do it the old-fashioned way. Okay, so that'll give 840. And then the denominator is going to give uh, 41 like that. Okay, so that should be the, the final answer to that problem then. Okay, so that's correct. I was just checking that on the on the calculator. I'm not going to give you anything with that big of arithmetic. That's that's a little bit better to use technology on in this day and age. All right, so that'll that'll take you through this. Uh, these are the main ideas. This is certainly more than more problems than you'll see, but it's the basic idea. All right, so I hope this helps you to prepare for your exam.